I'm watching it here. It's, um, I hope that everybody can hear uh, remotely. Here. So it's a, a great honor to um, introduce uh, a, a Professor Edward Whitman for I think his first colloquium in the physics department. I know you at least since I've been here, and that's almost 30 years. Uh, so uh, and many of us and all theoretical physicists know uh, Professor Witten. He has been uh, in driving force in our field for many years. Uh, you can argue convincingly that uh, Professor Witten may be the most influential theoretical physicist alive today. Um, his uh, work has uh, spanned uh, many areas. He has, um, many years ago, uh, done fundamental works on the large and limit of gauge theories, on the positivity energy theorem, on um, global anomalies in gauge theories. Um, and then he has uh, introduced uh, new concepts in field theory. I need to sit here. I mean, I can mention the Calabi-Yau compactifications, um, and then uh, uh, many, uh, many um, new discoveries in string theory. The cyber with then solution, a non perturbative solution of uh, non abelian gauge theories. And then uh, the discovery of non perturbative dualities that unify all the uh, 10 dimensional, uh, dimensional string theories. Um, Professor uh, Witten uh, received his PhD from Princeton University. He was a fellow of Harvard Society and uh, um, then a professor of physics at Princeton University uh, before joining the Institute of Advanced Studies in 1987, um, uh, where he is currently is um, the Charles Simoni Professor of Physics. Uh, the honors and awards are many, indeed, I can just select a few. MacArthur Fellowship in 82, Fellow of uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Fellow of the American Physical Society, the Iraq Medal, Alan Waterman Award of the National Science Foundation, Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he has eight honorary PhDs. Uh, <laughs> that he received the Fields Medal of the International Union of Mathematics, the uh, highest uh, recognition in, in mathematics, and even only every four years, unlike the Nobel Prize. Um, he's a Fellow of the American uh, Philosophical Society. Uh, Klein Medal of this, uh, from Stockholm University, the Danny Heinemann Prize. Um, uh, he's a foreign member of several uh, um, science academies. Uh, he received the Clay Research Award in 2001, um, the Crawford Prize in Mathematics from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in 2008, the Lawrence Medal of the uh, Dutch Academy of Science, the Fundamental Physics Prize from the Milner Foundation. Um, and the, the most recently a medal for exceptional achievements in research by the American Physical Society. Um, he's also honorary citizen of the city of Padua, when Padua had actually a very smart mayor. Um, <laughs> and, but in all these honors, you know, for many people, um, these honors are honors. Uh, I think that Professor Witten is in the, the, the you don't need category. So there was this story that may be true that uh, the two winners of the first Einstein Prize in Princeton received the prize from Einstein. One was Julian Schwinger, the other was uh, Kurt Gödel. To Schwinger, Einstein said, you deserve it. To Gödel, you don't need it. Thank you, Massimo, for the invitation. I will try not to be too embarrassed. <laughs> so, as you can see, I'll be talking about algebras and entropies for black holes and disintegrate space. I, sorry, for other entropies for black holes and disintegrate space. And I'll start with a general introduction about black holes and thermodynamics, and then I'll talk about a paper I wrote recently as well as work in progress. Given the time constraints of a single lecture, 
I'm going to try to explain the context rather than technical details. So the idea of black hole thermodynamics and black hole entropy started with Jacob Beckenstein, a student of John Wheeler at Princeton, who was inspired by questions from his advisor and asked what the second law of thermodynamics means in the presence of a black hole. For an ordinary system, the second law says that the entropy can only increase. But if we toss a cup of tea into a black hole, the entropy seems to disappear. Beckenstein wanted to generalize the concept of entropy so that the second law would hold even in the presence of a black hole. For this, he wanted to assign an entropy to the black hole. So he needed a property of the black hole that only increases so that he could interpret it as entropy. Well, it's not true that the black hole mass always increases. A rotating black hole, for instance, can lose mass when its rotation slows down. And in fact, it's believed that that's the process that powers jets coming from rotating black holes. But the rotational energy is ultimately driving those jets. But there is a quantity that always increases. Stephen Hawking had just proved the area theorem that says that the area of the black hole horizon can only increase. And so it was fairly natural for Beckenstein to propose that the black hole entropy should be a multiple of the horizon area. For example, this is the metric for a short chilled black hole of mass m. The horizon is at r equals 2gm. So the horizon area is 4 pi r squared, which works out to 16 pi g squared m squared. 16 pi g squared. Now, entropy, however, is dimensionless. So to relate the entropy of a black hole to its area, you need a constant of proportionality with dimensions of area. Luckily, you can make such a constant using Newton's constant, Planck's constant, and the speed of light. You can make the Planck length, which is roughly 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Its square is the Planck area. And measuring the area in those units, we get the Beckenstein Hawking, the Beckenstein entropy was the area over g times h1. One power of g from the previous power of g changed from the previous page, and now there's an h bar in the denominator. The constant one quarter was not clear in Beckenstein's work, was provided a few years later by Hawking in a way that I will explain shortly. So for a short shield black hole using the previous formula for the area, we find that the entropy is 4 pi g m squared over h bar. I usually set h bar to 1, but I've included it in this formula because that helps understand why the entropy, why black hole entropy is so big. So for example, the entropy of a black hole with the mass of the sun, based on this formula, is about 10 to the 20 times the entropy of the actual sun. That's not that different from the number of stars in the visible universe. So the entropy of a single black hole with the mass of the sun is pretty close to the entropy of all the stars in the visible universe. So Beckenstein defined a generalized entropy of a black hole. It was supposed to be the ordinary entropy of matter and radiation outside the black hole, plus black hole entropy defined as the area over constant times h bar g, where we now know that the constant is 4. And Beckenstein wasn't too precise about what he meant by the outside entropy. That was only clarified 20 years later in a way that I'll tell you shortly. Beckenstein proposed a generalized second law, according to which the generalized entropy always increases. <clears throat> now, while Stephen Hawking supposedly set out to prove that Beckenstein was wrong, and he ended up instead proving that Beckenstein was right. He did that by studying the behavior of a quantum field interacting with the black hole. Now, to to describe Hawking's calculation, it helps to have a picture of what a black hole spacetime is, known as a Penrose diagram. And in the pre Hawking discussion with the students, we spent quite a bit of time discussing Penrose diagrams. So hopefully all the students present today are quite up to speed on the subject, but nevertheless, I'll reiterate the point in just a couple of minutes. So first we assume a spherical symmetry in drawing a Penrose diagram. We suppress the angles. We only draw two coordinates, which are time which runs vertically and space which runs horizontally. 
But secondly, Penrose taught us that it was convenient to make a conformal mapping to get a picture that we can see. So time <coughs> runs from minus infinity to infinity, and space, meaning the distance from the origin, runs from zero to infinity. But then the infinite future and the infinite past would be way off the picture, and we'd have to imagine them. We can't see them. Penrose rescaled space and time by conformal mapping to get to a picture where infinity is a finite picture. He did it in such a way, I don't remember if I show this in the next picture. He did it in such a way that light rays travel at a pi over four angle to the vertical. So that would be a light ray going out. This is a light ray going in. Pi over four angle to the vertical. So this black line down here is past infinity. Anything coming in, technically it's where the retarded time is it? infinite. But technically, sorry. Technically, it's where the radius is just parameterized by the retarded time at infinite distance from its there. So this is a anyway, this is a spatial infinity of the past. This is spatial infinity of the future. And this important line is the horizon of the black hole. So and since a light ray can only travel at a pi over four angle from the vertical, if you're outside the horizon, you can escape to future infinity. But if you're behind the horizon, you'll end up with that wiggly line which is the black hole singularity. Finally, shown in red, is the portion of space not occupied by the collapsing star. In this picture, it looks like it comes from a point in the far past, but that's a little bit misleading. It comes from the conformal mapping Penrose has made to give us a picture that we can see. Regardless of how big the star is, it originates at this point in the past, and then it lives for a while, but it ends up behind the horizon. And in explaining the Hawking analysis of what ultimately is the radiation that comes from a black hole, we'll be interested entirely in the region outside the star, the region shown in white in the picture that's essentially vacuum because it's outside or after the collapsing star. So Penrose analyzed the quantum field interacting with this space time. He ended up proving that Beckinsing was right by showing that quantum mechanically, the black hole is not truly black, but has a temperature of order h bar. Well, imagine you're a physicist making a measurement of future infinity. A late time measurement will be up here. Any measurement at a big distance from the black hole is made on this line, but a late measurement is made up here. Future infinity is really this point. If you measure something up here, it got to you no faster than light from someplace on this blue line, which is a Cauchy hypersurface, technically. It's an initial value surface where you could define initial data. And whatever you see up here somehow came from initial data on the blue surface. It might have been better for me to draw the blue surface it went way up to spatial infinity. But anyway, I've drawn the important part of the initial value surface. Well, what will you see if you're sitting outside a black hole at late times, looking at what comes out? Part of Hawking's insight is that although the full details of exactly what you'll see depend on the details of the initial state of the collapsing star, if you ask what you'll see in the far future after transients die down, there's a universal answer. The reason there's a universal answer is that what you see here, so you're making your measurements up here, a signal Maybe you're measuring light that comes out of the star, or comes out of the black hole. Light travels at the speed of light, so it travels on these purple lines are meant to be at a pi over four angle from the vertical. So they represent outgoing the light rays. You're collecting the signal up here that came to you at the speed of light. It came to you from the blue region. We could trace it farther back, but we don't have to. We can think of it as being determined by what there was on the blue surface. The important thing is that the blue surface is essentially in the vacuum, it's outside the collapsing star. So whatever you observe here in the future is determined by what there was in a region that was essentially vacuum. The star has long since collapsed. The most important part of the picture is that the later you receive the signal, that means the farther, this point here is future time infinity. So you sit outside the black hole and you collect whatever's coming out of it. You wait a month, you wait a second month, maybe a third month. 
The longer you wait, the closer you are to this point. That means you're getting a signal that came to you at the speed of light from very, very close to the horizon. So the observer making measurements of light times is measuring the state of the quantum fields very close to the horizon, and therefore at very short distances. Everything you measure in an infinite amount of time up here came from a bounded region of space down here because of the way that the diagram was stretched. So the key fact is that every state is equivalent to the vacuum at short distances. So at late times, the observer is just probing the vacuum state near the horizon at short distances. And that's why there's a universal answer. No matter what the black hole formed from, what you're observing at late times is just a probe of the vacuum at short distances. So now I've zeroed in on this, the part that's important. Here's the part of the initial value surface very close to the horizon, parameterized by a coordinate u, which I define to be zero on the horizon, positive outside, negative behind the horizon. At what time will you see a signal that leaves the red surface at a given value of u? Well, if u is negative, you'll never see such a signal. If u is negative, that means you're behind the horizon. The signal never reaches the outside of the it ends up the singularity. If u is zero, the signal reaches the observer at time infinity, which is a bit too long to wait. <laughs> but if you're collecting data at very late times, u is very small. So the time at which, if u is very, very small but positive, the signal eventually escapes from the black hole, but it takes a long time. And the one equation you have to solve is the geodesic equation in the field on the black hole. And you learn that if you start a distance u from the horizon, the time at which the signal reaches the distance observer is logarithmically big as u goes to zero. It's 4gm times the log of 1 over u. So the time at which the signal reaches the distance observer blows up, but only logarithmically as u goes to zero. Well, we can invert this equation to determine what u is a function of t. And we find that u is exponentially small if t is big. And also du dt is exponentially small. So that means that if you make an observation of late times, it originated exponentially close to the horizon. And it started with an exponentially big energy. In other words, you have your detector that maybe is detecting photons at a fixed energy, maybe 1 eV. But the longer you wait, if you wait a little while, that photon that originated exponentially close to the horizon was an exponentially big energy, which then got redshifted down to 1 eV. So a mode of any given energy E that's observed at a late time originated from a very high energy mode near the horizon. By the way, is this green visible or we having trouble seeing this? So that's why there is a simple answer. A mode of very high energy propagates essentially freely all the, ge the geodesics I've been drawing. So the late time observer just sees something that started near the horizon and just since it had high energy propagates essentially freely out to infinity. So you're just directly measuring what the vacuum looks like at short distances. Now, how long is the time you have to wait? Well, for example, for a massive which is black hole, which is the mass of the sun, uh, 4GM is a few microseconds. So if T is measured in milliseconds, then the exponent is in hundreds. So um, U is incredibly small. So when you measure, when I say late times for a black hole with mass of the sun, late times means you just wait at least a millisecond. And then you're measuring what there was in the vacuum at incredibly short distances. So, and Hawking's calculation is valid at late times, but for a black hole with mass of the sun, late time just means time compared to microseconds. Now, you're off at infinity and you're measuring a quantum field, which, for example, if you're detecting photons, you'd be measuring the electric field, a photon detector. You can think of it as a device that measures the electric field of the radiation. I'll just give a name psi to the quantum field that you're measuring. The typical observer is a two-point function. Near the horizon, the quantum field has a power law singularity. For illustration, I've taken a, 
a single pole, although for the electromagnetic field, it really should be a double pole. And then this is what you measure near the horizon. To translate to what you measure at infinity, we just change variables from mu to t. Mu is a good coordinate near the horizon. T is a good coordinate for the observer at infinity. You literally just take the vacuum expectation value of the field at short distances, translate it to the terms used by the observer at infinity, and we get the two-point function of the outgoing radiation. And we notice something funny happens. We get something that's anti-periodic in imaginary time, because I took a single pole, or a double pole that would be periodic. And the anti-periodicity is with the anti-period of 8 pi gm. And if you've studied your know, quantum statistical mechanics, you may know that anti-periodicity periodicity in imaginary time is the hallmark of a thermal ensemble. In this case, a thermal ensemble with the temperature, Hawking temperature, which is the inverse of the period. So this computation is essentially how Hawking does with the Hawking temperature of the black hole. So we've learned that a black hole, after transients that depends on how it was created die down, radiates thermally at a temperature, which is the Hawking temperature. <clears throat> we can now find the entropy. We assume the second, first law of the E is TDS. For E, we take the mass of the black hole, or mc squared. For T, we take the Hawking temperature. So ds is then 8 pi g m dm, or in other words, 4 pi g m squared. The area of a Schwarzschild black hole is what we discussed before. So we get the entropy. And that's how Hawking confirmed Beckinson's Zontox and determined the constant one quarter that was unclear in Beckinson's work. Not long after Hawking's discovery, Gibbons and Hawking considered another situation with horizons, cosmology rather than black hole physics, and proposed that the area of a cosmological horizon is also a kind of entropy. So a cosmological observer in general can't see the whole universe, even if you are. The universe may be expanding so rapidly that some regions are forever out beyond your sight. And the boundary of what you can see if you wait long enough is called the cosmological horizon. So given some Hawking to be precise, assigned a temperature and an entropy to the region of the sitter space accessible to an observer. If we take at face value the acceleration of the cosmic expansion that astronomers have discovered in the last 20 plus years, then the sitter space will be a good approximation to the actual universe in about 10 to the 11 years. It's the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equations with a positive cosmological constant. Except I see I left out a factor of R squared. The metric is the universe expands exponentially when t goes to plus or minus infinity. In the real world, it's only the positive t part of this, which is a good approximation. The past of the universe isn't, as far as we know, described by the contracting part of this city space. Here's a Penrose diagram of the city space. Well, before I get to the Penrose diagram, because of the exponential expansion, galaxies in the real world will all be out of sight within roughly 10 to the 11 years, or a little less, unless they're gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. So for example, we're gravitationally bound to Andromeda and to a few dozen dwarf galaxies, making up a local group. Anything not in our local group will be beyond, beyond the cosmological horizon within 10 to the 11 years. Here's a Penrose diagram that captures it. The blue is future infinity, well, this blue at the bottom is past infinity. The left boundary is the or line of an observer that could be us. This is a mathematical model where the city space is assumed to be true for all times. In the real world, it's only the top part of the picture that's relevant to our future. The red diagonal line to the left is the future horizon, the region that the observer will never be able to see. There's also a past horizon that bounds the region the observer can communicate with. So, I can send a signal to somebody up here, although I can never know if the person read the message. Uh, I can receive a message from somebody who was here, but if that person chose to go this way, I will never be able to uh, see that person. So Gibbons and Hawking attributed to the cosmological horizon an entropy 
A over 4G, where A is the area of the cosmological horizon, which you can think of as the area of the two sphere in this picture, represented by a point on this diagonal line. It doesn't matter which point. And there's a corresponding temperature that goes with it. The meaning of the consider entropy has been something of a mystery ever since, although there are semi compelling proposals in the literature. Now, ever since the work of Bakkenstein, Hawking, and Gibbons, and others of the 70s, many researchers have thought that somehow the entropy A over 4G means that the black hole or the cosmological horizon can be described by some sort of degrees of freedom that live on its surface with one bit, or perhaps quantum mechanically one qubit, for every 4G of an area. For example, in a famous article in 1992, Wheeler, who had been Bakkenstein's advisor, illustrated that idea with this picture, where he visualized the horizon of a black hole, divided into little cells of area 4G, with a bit in each cell, although, as he describes in the article, the bit is the outcome of measurement of what we would now call a qubit. The term qubit hadn't yet been coined in 1992, I think it was coined a few years later. So Will didn't really want to speak of qubits. Well, I would say he described qubits on the surface of the horizon. As I said, the article was published in 92. I tend to believe that Will had been drawing this picture for 20 years. Although when I think back of pictures that I saw Will draw, I myself saw him draw some of his famous pictures. But I can't remember actually seeing this one myself. Modern understanding of black hole entropy, first of all, is partial, but secondly, what we the understanding we've achieved depends upon a, a more fundamental understanding of what entropy means quantum mechanically. So as a preliminary, let's just briefly review entropy classically. Entropy was first defined in the 19th century by Boltzmann. Consider a system of n particles in a box with positions x and the amount of p. A classical physicist like Boltzmann assumed that at a given time, x and p have definite values even if we don't know what they are. So we can describe the state of our knowledge by a probability distribution function, rho of p and x. And after great labor, Boltzmann and his successors such as Gibbs defined the entropy as the phase space integral of minus rho log rho. So that's a classical formula for the entropy. The analog in quantum theory of the density, classical density rho of p and x, is the density matrix rho of a quantum system. It has the property that if O is an operator, its expectation value in a given state is the trace of O times the density matrix. In general, rho is a positive self revealing operator of trace one. The students told me that they all know about density matrices, so I cut from the slides a little bit before I was going to say more because there was just too much to explain. So the quantum analog of Boltzmann's integral, you see integrating dp dx is like taking a trace quantum mechanical form. So the quantum version of the Gibbs formula is the von Neumann formula, where you replace the integral by a trace and you replace the probability distribution function by the density matrix, whose classical limit is the probability distribution function, if you work on the right basis. So in the classical limit, the von Neumann entropy goes over to the classical entropy, plus an additive constant that's actually ill-defined classically. For a system in thermal equilibrium, von Neumann entropy agrees with thermodynamic entropy, but it's defined for any quantum system in any state, whether it's in thermal equilibrium or not. There's a basic difference between the classical and quantum entropy. The classical entropy, Surely measures our lack of knowledge about the microscopic state of the system. We think that rho has a definite value, sorry, we think that p and x have definite values, and we use a probability distribution function because we don't know the microscopic values. Quantum mechanically, though, the density matrix might be the most precise description of the system that's possible if the system is entangled with something else. So in the case of an entangled system that can't be described by a pure state, it has to be described by density matrix. Yeah, you have a charm. And it has a positive von Neumann entropy. So and we know the state as well as uh, we We also are working out the so 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 concretely, if we consider a system 
what's called a bipartite system. That's just a fancy name for a system that has two parts, A and B. <clears throat> so it has a tensor product Hilbert space. I didn't write it on the slide, so I'll just on the blackboard. The Hilbert space is a tensor product of the Hilbert space with system A and the Hilbert space with system B. Even if the overall system is in a pure state, psi A B, subsystem A will typically be in a mixed state described by a reduced density matrix that you can construct by summing over the states of system B to focus on a density matrix that only acts on the Hilbert space of system A. So a system that's entangled with something else will have a non-zero von Neumann entropy, which therefore is called entanglement entropy. Now, the reason I took a few moments to sort of inadequately, or barely, introduce density matrices and entanglement entropy is that that's key in modern understanding of the vacancy Hawking entropy. The idea that the vacancy Hawking entropy of a black hole should be understood as entanglement entropy recording in Marcel Sorkin in a paper that attracted not much attention. The idea was just the following. <clears throat> In a quantum field theory, you divide space into two regions, A and B. Now, in Sorkin's motivation, A was the region outside the horizon, and B is the region behind the horizon. But for these general remarks, A and B could be anything. Let psi be a state of the system. And we can assume it's a pure state. For example, psi might be the vacuum state. As I just said, <clears throat> Even if the whole world is in a pure state, the subsystem is in a mixed state with the density matrix. In this case, the subsystem is just all possible observables in all state of the universe in region A. So I feel like region A itself is the subsystem. Region A and all of its contents, we're thinking of as a big subsystem of the whole universe. So like any subsystem, it will have a reduced density matrix for regions, measurements in region A. And then you can try to calculate its von Neumann entropy. And as discovered by Sorkin and in more detail in this follow-up paper, you find that its ultraviolet divergence, regardless of the state sign, and moreover, the coefficient of the leading divergence is proportional to the area A of the boundary between the two regions, A and B. Now, Sorkin's idea in modern language was that somehow gravity cuts off the divergence, leaving an entanglement entropy in the vacuum between the two regions. That's not the area times infinity, but instead is the area times four over g. If you like, gravity had been neglected in this calculation. This calculation was done for quantum field theory in flat space. One didn't know how to include gravity. So getting infinity in that calculation just means that the answer is infinity if g Newton's constant is zero. Well, Sorkin said that maybe if you knew how to include gravity, the answer would be not infinity, but 1 over g, so it nearly goes to infinity as g goes to 0. And so he said that the entanglement entropy maybe is really not a times infinity, but a over 4g. That makes a lot of intuitive sense as it matches two ideas. One is that what Beckenstein thought he was describing was the irreducible entropy of a black hole to an observer outside the horizon. And in quantum mechanics, the irreducible entropy of any system is its von Neumann entropy. So this is an attempt at putting into math what will that contain words. So that's reason one, reason one. Reason two is that the divergence, ultraviolet divergence so can found is proportional to the area because it comes from short wavelength modes near the horizon. As if, after cutting off the divergence, the density of quantum degrees of freedom create an area that is 4J, as in Wheeler's famous picture. Anyway, this, what I just explained, was kind of the state of understanding in the 80s. The next development I want to mention was in the 90s by Susskind and Ugland. They made a simple observation that strongly supports the interpretation well, thinking about entanglement entropy. Remember, Beckenstein had defined the generalized entropy, which is the area of the 4GH bar, plus the entropy of 
the ordinary entropy outside of Lambda. And Bakkenstein didn't really say what should be meant by the ordinary entropy. He assumed that thermodynamics was valid. Well, thermodynamics isn't valid for any state of matter. Something might not be in thermal equilibrium. You might simply have a million scattered particles, not at all described by a thermal ensemble. What might be meant by S out in that case? Well, Saska and Oslo said that S out should always be interpreted as the entanglement entropy of the quantum fields outside the horizon, but with an ultraviolet cutoff. And then they observed that the sum of these two terms is better defined than either term is separately. Sorkin had observed that, the, that S out has an ultraviolet divergence. But apparently no one before Saskan and Odlum pointed out the even more elementary fact that A over 4GH bar also has an ultraviolet divergence, because G does. In other words, I gave you earlier a derivation of Hawking rate, Hawking's temperature of the black hole, and I didn't say carefully what was the G in that derivation. But since we didn't calculate any loops, we were doing class, semi-classical physics, and presumably the G in that discussion was G0, the bare Newton constant. But Beckenstein was talking about the physical Newton's constant. So we should discuss the renormalization between the bare Newton's constant and the physical Newton's constant. And you'll soon discover at the one-loop level that there's a divergence that looks like this, that there's a quadratic divergence in general relativity, that 1 over g is 1 over g naught plus a constant times lambda squared. And Susskind and Oglum showed that the one-loop divergence in the renormalization of this term is equal and opposite to the one-loop divergence in this term. So at the one-loop order, they showed that the sum was finite, although neither term was separately. And these arguments were reforming and extended over. So the modern understanding definitely is that the generalized entropy is well defined, but neither term is separately. Now, 21st century developments have strongly supported these ideas, but there's lots of mystery. In the remaining time, I'm just going to talk about one aspect of the story, which is the following the question that I just alluded to. Why is entanglement entropy ill-defined in quantum field theory so that S out has the quadratic divergence work and pointed out, but well-defined once gravity is included? That rather narrow question is the only aim of the rest of the book. I'll try to give an answer to that question, although perhaps a slightly abstract answer. First, we need one more slide to review what happens in ordinary quantum fields. If you consider entanglement between two systems A and B, you usually assume at the start that each system has its own Hilbert space, H A and H B. The combined system then has a tensor product Hilbert space. A state psi A B in the combined Hilbert space might be a simple tensor product of states psi A and psi B. In that case, systems A and B separately can be described by pure states, and then psi A and psi B, and there's no entanglement entry. More generally, we could have what's called an entangled state of the two systems. For a more general state that could, has an expansion like this one, we see that A and B are entangled. And in that case, system A, for example, has a density matrix of rank greater than 1 and a non zero one Riemann entropy. Now, the point of explaining all this, though, is that in ordinary quantum mechanics, entanglement entropy is a property of the state. Because we could have had an unentangled state, a product state, where there would be no entanglement entropy, no von Neumann entropy. Instead, a generic state does have von Neumann entropy, but it's a property of the state. So, as I just said, in ordinary quantum mechanics, whether or not a state has non zero entanglement and entanglement entropy depends on the state. That's not so for entanglement entropy between different regions in quantum field theory. Divergence found by Sorkin was an ultraviolet divergence, so it does not depend on the state. Every state looks like the vacuum at short distances. So every state has the same ultraviolet divergence that Sorkin found. The root of the problem is that in the situation considered by Sorkin, it's not true that there are southward and Hilbert spaces, H, A, and H, B, for the inside and outside regions. There's only a combined Hilbert space, curly H, for the whole system. <coughs> 
Was the separate regions A and B, however, not Hilbert spaces, but only algebras of the plurals? These algebras act on the Hilbert space of the whole system, so they can be defined to be technically von Neumann algebras. I kind of said in parentheses what's a von Neumann algebra. Without any technicality, just think of it as a nice algebra of observables. In this case, the observables if you live in region A or the observables if you live in region B are two different algebras, <coughs> which in a moment will be called curly A and curly B. Now, there are three types of von Neumann algebra. I'm sorry, I'll click the slide upon you. The first <laughs> one is the one that you know about without giving it a name. A type 1 algebra is the algebra of all operators on the Hilbert space, or technically all bounded operators. In the ordinary quantum mechanics, when we discuss this, it has a Hilbert space HA. And but what we think of as the algebra of observables is just all operators on the Hilbert space. And that's of type 1 by definition. A type 1 algebra can have quantum pure states, just vectors of HA. And it can have density matrices, as you learned about in quantum mechanics courses. And it can have von Neumann metrics. So type one is the familiar situation in ordinary quantum mechanics, where entropies, density matrices, and pure states all exist. The other types are less familiar. I'll describe them in a moment, but first I'll give you the bottom line. A type two algebra doesn't have pure states, but it still has density matrices and entropies. A type three algebra is the worst type. It doesn't have pure states and it doesn't have density matrices or entropies. Well, by now you might anticipate the bad news. <laughs> In quantum field theory, the algebra of observables of a region of space time is always of type 3. That's quantum field theory without gravity. So, to a region, you can never associate a pure state or a density matrix or an entropy. The type 3 nature of the algebra of observables in the region outside the horizon is the reason, in quotes, and it's an abstract explanation of the universal ultraviolet divergence of the entanglement entropy. However, it turns out that including gravity even semi constantly changes the picture. At least in the case of the black hole or the center space, including gravity at a semi classical level changes the <coughs> algebra of the region outside the horizon. From type 3 to type 2. I might use this thing because I'm tired of wondering if you can see the green dot. <laughs> so I don't know what would happen if you could include gravity exactly. I also don't know for sure if a similar picture holds for any space time with our horizon. I hope so, but I certainly don't know for sure. But at least for the black hole and the center space, when gravity is turned on semi constantly, the region outside the horizon is described by a type 2 algebra, meaning an algebra where the notion of entropy is well defined. We can interpret that as a somewhat abstract answer to the question of why including gravity suddenly enables us to convert the ill-defined S out into the better defined generalized entropy of vacancy. <clears throat> well, to understand how it works, we need at least a bare minimum of knowledge of what is an algebra of type 2 or type 3. So they can be most simply described as algebras that act on certain thermal systems. So consider a finite thermal system, let's say a thermal system with finitely many qubits, with Hamiltonian H and inverse temperature beta. It has a density matrix that you learn about in statistical mechanics, where Z is the partition function, the constant, so that the trace of the density matrix is 1. Roughly speaking, the thermal field double is a pure state of a larger system that has this density matrix. For a finite system, you just literally introduce a second copy of the original system, and then you write this explicit formula involving a sum over all the energy levels of your system. And the point of the formula is that psi is a pure state of a bigger system, but the reduced density matrix for the original system is the thermal density matrix. So instead of discussing thermodynamics of the original system, you can describe physics in terms of the pure state of this bigger system. So in particular, for any operator A or the subsystem capital A, the expectation value of the operator in this state is the same as its trace times the thermal density matrix. <coughs> 
Now, this formula actually is not well defined in the thermodynamic limit of the infinite system because z becomes infinite and the number of terms in the sum becomes uncountably due. Although this formula doesn't make sense, you can nevertheless define the thermodynamic limit of a state, the thermodynamic double state, in which this is true. You see, thermodynamic expectation values do have a thermodynamic limit. And you can define a state where this equation is true, even though this formula is only valid for the finite cases. It's when you take the thermodynamic limit that algebras of type 2 and 3 come in. Let's discuss how this works for the simplest Hamiltonian we know, which is zero. That's one Hamiltonian that we know how to diagonalize. <laughs> <laughs> Consider n qubits with the Hamiltonian being zero. Well, the Hilbert space has dimension 2 to the n. That's also the partition function, so z is 2 to the n. The thermal field double state is just a completely entangled state of the system of n qubits with another system consisting of n other qubits. Here I've written a formula for the thermal field double state. So, so what to say in the way is the nth qubit of the first system is completely in time system, and the nth qubit of the second system. Now let A and B be operators that act only in the first k spins of the first system, for some k, and define a function which is the expectation value of this state, uh, of that operator in the state side. To me, it looks like the green dot is fading, so I'll go back. <laughs> now, this function has the property. It's only defined if you have enough qubits of that all the ones that the operator AX1 are included. But once it's defined, including more qubits doesn't matter. So this function has a thermodynamic limit. And you can see the basal identities. It's normalized so that f of 1 is 1, and it satisfies f of AB equals f of BA. And you can define it for any we defined it for any system that acts in any finite set of qubits. And so far we so far we defined it with the algebra A naught of all operators that act in only finitely many qubits of system A. But you can take the closure on one Roman sense, that means there are certain operators that with small probability act on an arbitrary number of qubits. Then you complete this algebra in order to a binomial algebra A. It still has a function f of a with the properties I stated. Well, since it obeys f of a b equals f of b a, it's usually called a trace. We formally define this function f of a to be the trace of a. It's not the trace of a in any Hilbert space representation. It's more like a renormalized trace with an infinite factor removed. We know a more elementary example of the infinite dimensional algebra with a trace. The type 1 algebra B of all operators on an infinite dimensional Hubbard space called the H. In that example, while we can define a trace, it's not defined for all elements, only for those that are said to be trace class in the math language. For example, the identity doesn't have a trace. The identity on an infinite dimensional Hubbard space is trying to have a trace of infinity. But if you want traces to be finite, you can't define the identity without a trace. But from the infinite system of qubits with Hamiltonian 0, we constructed an algebra A in which every element has a trace. So clearly it's an essentially new kind of algebra. It's said to be a type 2 one. First constructed in precisely the way I've told you by Murray and von Neumann. There's one other There's one other one. With no addition. If A is if A is we just constructed. We have, some, we have some sound from around from our virtual colleague. Yeah, yeah. Well, it should be. Well, if you listen once, if you listen once, if A is the type of A is the type of A, just constructed, B is the algebra of all of our virtual Hubbard space. They're tensor power. Could everyone please mute? Could everyone please mute that song? Okay, I think that I muted upon entry, so at least uh, that was a reminder to mute. Then, yeah, you're not on your...
Well, hopefully everyone who's online has muted so that we can hear here. So you all know about the type one algebra of all operators of the space. I told you one new algebra A. The tensor product is a separate new algebra, second new algebra C. It has a trace since each factor does. Trace is not defined for all elements because that's not true in B. And C is a new kind of algebra that's said to be of type two infinity. It turns out that A and C are the important types of type two algebras for our applications. C is related to the black hole and A is related to the city space. Now, if you take the thermofield double for almost any non zero Hamiltonian, you've got a type three algebra. So I'm worried about the time, so I don't want to explain this in much detail. The simplest non zero Hamiltonian is a sum of single qubit Hamiltonians. That's a Hamiltonian we can still diagonalize. Not much trouble. I basically diagonalize it for because it's a sum of commuting operators. And although it's pretty trivial, that uh, Hamiltonian is sufficiently non trivial so that if you take the thermofield double state, it just means you take, you take infinite many, you take a pair of qubits in this state. What that state is, is it's a pure state such that the density matrix for rho A is a thermal density matrix with this Hamiltonian. It's, it's uh, fully entangled in the sense that the density matrix is invertible. But it's not maximally entangled because the eigenvalues of the density matrix are not equal. If you take a quantum system that has full but not maximal entanglement, then in the thermodynamic limit you get a type 3 algebra. And it doesn't really matter what you start with. Even something as trivial as this is sufficiently non trivial, but you get a type 3 algebra if you go through the same exercise as before, defining the same function at f of a, uh, taking the large n limit. A function exists, but it's not a trace, and now you get a binomial algebra of type 3, which were in fact first constructed, I think, in the 60s, in precisely this way. So an algebra of type 2 or type 3 does not have an irreducible representation in the Hilbert space. Whenever such an algebra acts on the Hilbert space H, it always commutes with another algebra of the same type, either type 2 or type 3. For example, we constructed type 2 and type 3 algebras by acting on part A of a bipart system, bipartite system AB. So those algebras commuted with an identical algebra acting on system B in our construction. So that's true in general. They never have irreducible representations. The difference between type 2 and type 3 is that type 2 has a trace, type 3 is not. In the type 2 algebra, the trace is non-degenerate in the sense that if you consider the trace of a product AB as a bilinear function on the algebra, then it's non-degenerate. That follows from the fact that trace of A over A is positive for all of non zero A. So if f of A is any linear function on the algebra, it's the trace of A times B for some element B of the algebra. So let's go back to the situation considered by Sorkin with the region inside the black hole horizon shown in gray and the region of space outside the black hole horizon shown in white. Consider a state solely of the whole universe. Suppose it were true that the physics in region A is described by a type 2 algebra curly A. Remember, in the absence of gravity, that's not true. In the absence of gravity, it's type 3. But if gravity would convert the algebra from type 3 to type 2, we would say the following. Whatever the state psi is of the universe, we have a linear function on the algebra that takes A to its exponential value in the state psi. And like any linear function, that would be the trace of A times rho A for some rho A in the algebra. Now, in ordinary quantum mechanics, in other words, if the algebra is of type 1, this formula is actually the definition of the density matrix. If you have a bipartite system, as an operator that only acts in the first part. The density definition of the density matrix of system A is that the expectation value of a little a in a state of the whole universe is the trace in the subsystem of little a times the density matrix. That formula is, the, is a version of the density, definition of the density matrix in ordinary quantum mechanics. 
So it's reasonable here to call the order if the density matrix also in the type 2 situation. Once we have density matrices, we can define algebras. So if the region outside the horizon is described by a type 2 algebra, then in contrast to what happens in ordinary quantum theory, we could define entries. Now, as I've already explained, in ordinary quantum field theory, the algebras are type 3. But it turns out that when we include gravity, even for very weak coupling, things are different. Gravitational effects, even for arbitrarily weak coupling, convert the type 3 algebras into type 2 algebras. The mathematical mechanisms that lead to this go back to the 1970s and have long said they've long been known. What's new is only that these mechanisms are actually implemented by perturbative gravity in the field of a black hole or this inner space. The de details are different in the two cases, but I will really only have time for very brief explanations. Here's a Penrose diagram of the maximally extended Churchill black hole in a asymptotically flat space time. And I now see that although I, at least for the students, we had an introduction to Penrose diagrams in the pre meeting, but Oh, we discussed a few Penrose diagrams, but I forgot to draw this one, which is the Penrose diagram for maximally extended curvature of black hole. So people like um, Pascal, Sikaris, Sage, and others discovered in the 50s and 60s. But if you take the Schwarzschild solution and handle it extended as much as it can be extended, it describes a wormhole between two asymptotically flat regions, which I have in this picture called A and B. And then uh, Gibbons, Hogging, and Israel, among others, discovered that the natural state of a black hole is a completely entangled state between the two regions in the thermofield double state, which is related to thermal equilibrium in one side of the other. But I will, there isn't time to explain that properly, so I won't make much use of it. In weakly coupled quantum field theory, to construct a Hilbert space H for quantum fields in the black hole space time. In the case of any field theory other than the gravitational field, H is acted on by type 3 algebras over observables in region A or B, and these algebras, which I've called curly A and curly B, are of type 3. That would be true in any ordinary quantum field theory. But there is a subtlety in constructing the Hilbert space in the case of the gravitational field, even in the weak couple model. Almost all the construction proceeds similarly to what we would have for any other field. And we get a Hilbert space H0 acted on by type 3 algebras, A0 and B0. But there are two canonically conjugate modes in the case of gravity that do not have an analog for any other field. One of these modes describes the fluctuation in the mass of the black hole. There's a classical solution for any assumed mass of the black hole, so there's a mode of the gravitational field where the black hole mass changes. And in classical physics, any mode always has a canonical conjugate, so you should ask what's canonically conjugate to the mass of the black hole. The answer is a little bit subtle, but a shift in the time measured by the observers in the two regions is canonically conjugate to the mass of the black hole. I won't explain that carefully, I'll just assume that you know about the black hole mass and you'll accept that it has to be canonically conjugate to something. So these two extra operators, let's say x and p, they're canonically conjugate. So we can let them act on the Hilbert space of functions of one of the two variables, or one acts by multiplication of the other by differentiation. For example, I can assume that x acts by multiplication, and then p by differentiation. So the combined Hilbert space is what we had without those two modes, and would, would be similar to the Hilbert space of the ordinary quantum field in the field of the black hole. But we have to add to it this little baby extra Hilbert space to account for two extra modes that don't have analogs of ordinary quantum field theory. So the combined Hilbert space is H0 tensored with L2 of R. Now, what are the observers of the of a guy who lives to the right of the black hole horizon in region A? Well, you've got the algebra A0 of operators at H0, it's of type 3. Well, there's actually one more operator you can measure that's not in, that's not in H0. It's, um, it's the ADM energy measured at infinity to the right of the horizon. If you don't know the phrase ADM energy, which is 
general enough energy window to say it's the measurement energy measured at infinity. The observer of infinity, the observer to the right of the black hole, can measure the total energy of the system. That makes sense as an operator in the combined system, but it doesn't make sense as an operator that does an HMA. You can show that it acts on the combined system in the Y I've indicated here, where X is one of these extra operators. On the other piece, I apologize for the technical language, the other piece generates the modular automorphism group of the automorphism state of the black hole. The bulk black hole solution has a killing vector here, and the H hat is the conserved charge associated with the killing vector field. So that explanation will make sense to some for him this explanation did not. Otherwise, just accept that there's some formula where the total energy is a sum of an operator on this new part of Hilbert space and an operator on the old part. In short, the difference between ordinary quantum field theory in the field of black hole and gravity, or at least the difference between the, the weak coupling limit when Newton's constant is very small, is just that we have to slightly enlarge the Hilbert space and we have to add one more generator to the algebra, which is this thing, x plus something, that I didn't really explain much. In the language used by people who work on operator algebras, what we've discovered is that the algebra curly A of all our observables outside the black hole horizon is the cross product of the type 3 algebra A0 by its modular automorphism group. So that actually means that the algebra A of observables outside a black hole is of type to infinity and in particular has a trace and a notion of density matrix and entropy. You don't actually have to need, need to know any uh, von Neumann algebra theory. The people who discovered this were doing von Neumann algebras. But there's an explicit formula through the trace. Its properties are discussed in one paper. So you can understand that formula and verify that it is a trace without knowing any of the meaning of any of the big words I used at the lowest points. So just by including two extra modes that exist for gravity but only exist for ordinary quantum fields in the presence of a black hole, magically the type 3 algebra became a type 2 algebra that has a trace and therefore a notion of entropy. Once you have a trace, you have a notion of a density matrix, so you can define an entropy. And you can show that up to an undefined additive constant that doesn't depend on the state, the entropy you define this way agrees with the Beckinsing proposal. I possibly should have written the name of Aaron Wall on this formula on this slide, because uh, you need Aaron Wall's reworking of the Beckinsing proposal. Something similar happens in the center space. Here's the setup. I drew this diagram before. The left boundary is the world line of an observer in the center space. The bottom and top blue lines represent the infinite past and future. The diagonal lines are the past and future horizons of the observer. The green region is called the static patch. It's the reason that region that's causally accessible to the observer. The observer can both send a signal to that region and also um, observe it. See, the observer can do an experiment on anything in the static patch. What does it mean to do an experiment? You don't want to just passively observe something. For example, you probe it with a light ray or maybe an electron beam or something. You can send some kind of probe at a point to the green patch, and you can see what happens. So the green patch is the region that you can study by experiments. It's called the static patch, the region causally accessible to the observer. There's a time translation symmetry of the static patch, I've called it H. In the ordinary quantum field theory, you'd associate the Hilbert space H naught to the sitter space and a type 3 algebra A naught of operators of the static patch that acts on it. So, it takes a little bit of discussion, but all the experiments of the observer in the stat who probes the static patch are described by this algebra A naught of observer operators in the static patch. So A naught describes all conceivable experiments made by the observer if there was no gravity. But in a closed universe, gravity changes the picture because the space-time symmetries have to be interpreted as constraints. Here, the important one is time translation symmetry of the static patch. It has to be interpreted as a constraint 
which means we have to replace the algebra A0 by its subalgebra that I've got A0 with the superscript H consisting of all operators that commute with A0. Well, that doesn't work. The way people in operator algebra theory say it is that the modular automorphism group acts ergodically, and A0 H is trivial. So there aren't any operators we can define after taking the constraint into account. So what are we going to do? Well, the only way to get a reasonable answer, after all, what we want is an algebra that describes the uh, measurements that can make, be made by an observer. The reason we're studying the static patch in the first place is that there's an observer in the static patch and we want to describe the static, that observer's measurements. That was why I explained that the green region is the region that the <coughs> observer can probe by experiments. <clears throat> so, um, well, to get a reasonable answer, we have to include the observer in the analysis, but we didn't, don't need to know very much about the observer. We can boil the observer down to the minimum, which is to think of the observer just as a clock. So I'll give the observer a clock with the Hamiltonian that I'll call little x. It's physically reasonable to assume that the observer's energy is bounded by by zero. So I'll assume that x is non-negative. So the effect of including the observer is to modify the Hubble space from what it was before to what it was before tensored with the space of all states of the clock, in other words, L2 over R plus. The very integral functions of x, but we be concerned that x is non negative. Well, we're going to assume that in principle the observer can manipulate the clock in any desired fashion. So the complete algebra of observables ignoring the constraints is what it was before times all operators on the Hilbert space of the clock. Finally, the constraint becomes the total Hamiltonian of the quantum fields plus the observer. H plus H of the observer. And so the correct algebra of observables, taking into account the presence of the observer as well as the clock, is actually, it's not the H, the wrong answer was the H and right part of A1. The correct answer is to replace A0 by A1, which includes the observer, and likewise, to replace H, by a hat that includes the observer. So you should take the h hat invariant part of the extended algebra. And it turns out that this algebra is of type 2 1, which means there's a notion of density matrix and entropy. And a lot more happens. Because the algebra is of type 2 1 rather than type 2 infinity, there's a state of maximum entropy. That state corresponds to the natural decimal state, sometimes called the bunch baby state. The density matrix of the maximum entropy state is one. So this state has what's called a flat entanglement spectrum. All the eigenvalues of the density matrix are equal. As first predicted in a different way by these authors, and what I've said is related to work of others. And again, facts known from gravity can be recovered from the algebra. Now, before concluding, I should stress something I briefly mentioned but didn't properly explain. Entropy defined this way is really defined up to an additive constant. So it's analogous to entropy in classical physics. Entropy in classical physics is defined up to an additive constant by formulas like the, like the first law. In classical physics, there's no way to fix this constant. And similarly, in the context of a type 2 algebra, there's no physically natural way to fix the constant. To conclude, that we've learned that at the level of semi classical gravity, it's possible to define an algebra A such that the generalized entropy, as defined by Gerstein and Hawking and said by many others subsequently, in the presence of a black hole or cosmological horizon, actually is the entropy of the state of the algebra. The algebra does not have pure states, so at this level, for example, there's no such that you can't define a pure state of the black hole. Thank you. Time for questions. And start. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. Um, 
you, you said uh, actually on this slide here that yeah. those terms on the right hand side are, are separately divergent yeah. uh, but, at, at one loop. Yes. So how do I reconcile that? I mean, I can measure the, the renormalized uh, Newton's constant in the solar system, for example, right? So how do I? Ever well, <laughs> for weak coupling, there is a type three algebra, the yeah. infinite coupling. And then the type two algebra. I explained how to discover it's type two when you get three. Perturbation theory leaves it as a type two algebra. Whatever perturbation theory does, there's still a type two algebra. In general, entropy is defined for type two algebra. So this is a slightly abstract explanation of the cancellation people are discovered earlier, going back to Saskan Nurgle. So you can say that you just calculate what Saskan Nurgle did, whatever it is, to say that, to observe that it was clever, but also quite simple, at least in the original version. They showed that the Feynman diagrams you needed to calculate the first term are equal and opposite in sign to the Feynman diagrams that go into the right part of the second one. So the answer, well, since 1993, when Newton's discovered, the standard answer has been that the UV divergence is canceled in this expression. I've offered an alternative explanation of the same fact. The algebra is of type 2, and that implies that you can define entropy. Now, I don't expect everyone to necessarily work this explanation at first sight. And to be honest, I don't know how important this explanation is. Depending on how things develop in the future, it might be very important or it might be a curiosity. You know, Can I ask you a yeah. tough question? So that sentence has no notion of black hole microstate. Yeah. So if we have the old picture of Hawking pairs yes. that are entangled to something, and we say entangled to the interior of the black hole, yes. then the junior the junior intuition of what entanglement is in this new setup of algebras, what it is? I mean, entropy is being caused by what if there's no notion of states inside the hole? Well, there is, but you see, entropy defined this way is normalized entropy. When I defined a trace, we had removed the infinite factor. Okay. So if we had tried to define the trace of row log row without removing the infinite factor from the trace, we would have trivially gotten infinity. Had we multiplied, it only would have been an additive infinity, not multiplicative. Because if you multiply the trace by something, you would divide row by the same thing to make the trace of row still equal to one. But then when you have the trace of row log row, the logarithm would be shifted. Mm. So there was an additive renormalization that went into defining what we mean by the entropy of the algebra. So there is a renormal, okay, physically, why is this? This is a discussion in the small g limit. But the correct answer for black hole and cosmological entropy in the small g limit is infinity, since according to the existing model, it's proportional to area over 4g, which is infinity or g equals infinity. So if we're working near g equals infinity, there actually is a physical infinity that has to be renormalized away. So we got finite answers, but there is a renormalization built in. The renormalization is built in when we define the trace. G infinity means G equals zero. Did I say infinity? One over G was infinity. G, G is zero. Yes. And There's an infinity in the Dugan's and Hawking entropy because G is zero. Another way to say it is if you had somebody else giving a colloquium on quantum mechanics and dissonance space, they'd come, like one of Saskind or most researchers in that area, they would have possibly speculated. That the center space could be understood in terms of the number of qubits proportional to one over g. Well, that's infinite when g goes to zero. And since we're working near g equals zero, our starting point is to think about how we would describe an infinite system of qubits. Um, I, I may have uh, misheard, but the, I heard you saying that in flat space time that, that you have this type three yes. interval to work with, but it seemed like you said, when you add gravity and you work in the context of a black hole, then things are more well Black hole or dissonance space. Yes. Right. And, but I was, but I didn't hear uh, what happens if you add gravity, but you don't, you're not necessarily around a, a black hole. Or well, you would discuss it in that. Well, yeah. well, I can tell you what I, I can tell you the most optimistic answer, but I don't have a good argument for it. I would hope some version of the following is true that whenever there are horizons, either black hole or cosmological horizons, there's a type 2 algebra that describes that situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know that to be true. I, only, I really only know, understand well the two cases I've talked about. 
although I, I gave such a sketchy explanation of both. But anyway, there's a precise story for those two cases. And well, the real world is much more complicated than disease because it's filled with animals. <coughs> it's expanding. <laughs> to our best knowledge, the real world does have cosmological horizons and black hole horizons. I would like to know that in that generality, there is a connectivity between them. But the explanation right now, we're not robust enough to apply to that. But originally, I only understood the black hole. And the paper on the space hasn't even been written yet. So. So how can I think about this uh, edited constant ambiguity that I should be like discussed here in the context of uh, Strominger and Vafa derivation of the microscopic, I mean microscopic well, derivation of the black hole? Strominger and Vafa had a microscopic derivation for a black hole at zero temperature. A black hole at zero temperature has quantum microstates, and you can count them. <coughs> in this picture, we don't define the microstates of a black hole at positive temperature. You want me to find a type 2 algebra? You can define its entropy, but you can't define its microstates. I think it's conceivable that that's the right answer. In other words, I'm not actually convinced that quantum microstates make sense for a black hole at positive temperature. The reason I'm not is that just, well, there's a kind of complementarity between talking about quantum microstates and talking about a black hole. To say something is a black hole, you have to have a a classical notion of causality. So you have to be sufficiently close to a classical space-time picture. In the limit that g goes to zero, and asymptotically near g equals zero, I could have called it h bars. Asymptotically, when h bars near zero, uh, we do have classical space-time notions, and we can definitely say something is a black hole. But in that asymptotic sense, I don't think that what you say makes sense. If, for example, an ADS-CFT duality, or we take a black hole of some given mass. Microstates make sense. So we're convinced that in the right setting, black hole microstates make sense. But it's not clear that that's a setting we can also, in a precise way, say that something is a black hole. So I actually think it's quite conceivable. Well, first, as I said, I don't know that it's true in general, but with more cosmological horizons, there is a type 2 energy. But it has horizons in general. But I think it's quite conceivable that the best you can do in general with horizons is a type 2 energy. And that you don't simultaneously have a precise statement that there's a horizon, and also that you have quantum microstates. So I can imagine a future. The most extre extreme extrapolation from our example is that conceivably the kind of answer I've explained is first of all general and secondly, in a sense, the best possible. Questions? Can I make a question? So I'll try to formulate my question in the best way. So. So we know that physics decouples like uh, based on the energy. So and from high energy, then you go down, and then there is a sequence of symmetry breaking that leaves yeah. some behind, some yes. uh, pions, some uh, yes. uh, boson. Now in this case, we have algebras, and you said that a turning of turning on um, um, gravity changed a type three algebra in a type two algebra. Yeah. So here is not really a symmetry that is breaking, but it's an algebra that is changing. Yeah. So is there something like that? This transformation of two algebras like when it leaves behind like something like a particle like like a, a, a mode or that is like I mean traceable in a sense. To, to me it's just a matter of studying perturbation theory more carefully. So it's been implicitly seen in the literature that you can think of gravity as another quantum field. That's a slightly unfair statement. For some purposes gravity has been treated as just another quantum field and it turns out that if you're a little bit more precise, you can get a better answer. This story that I explained should be, can be thought of as happening at arbitrarily low energies. The black hole can be very big. When you describe the algebra A0 of observables outside the black hole horizon, you could approximate it by just observables that have massless particles, photons as far as we're interested in the photons and gravities. Um, the shift from type 3 to type 2. Can be viewed as a purely inferior thing. It doesn't require, it doesn't depend on any assumptions about what's happening in true processes. So, maybe one question is that in, when you describe algebra, the type 3 to type 2, G was not particularly explicit. So, how the Newton constant enters into the construction, in the algebraic construction? 
Well, the way I wrote it in my paper, I made it explicit that we were doing perturbation theory in order of n that corresponded to one over gym. But uh, my co-author of the current project has kind of convinced me that the other quality is better. The moment X, I call X and P only exist because of gravity, and the only input that we need from gravity is that they exist. <laughs> but then, I mean, G would be one? <laughs> well, if G was one, you wouldn't be able to plug that in. You should imagine that G is very small. So if G is in line with the G goes to zero, you can describe the type two algebra explicitly. Then, if you wanted to do better, you could do perturbation theory. Everything would be very complicated, but one would expect that the algebra remains of type two. Thank you. the question was, uh, uh, what if you have a single side black hole, like a geon, or something that is explicitly known but doesn't have the... Okay, noise. imagine a black hole that formed from class. That's a Penrose diagram we did discuss with the students in the pre-Macaulay discussion. Um, we haven't worked out the details, but I think you can describe... I believe that is in it. I believe the discussion of the black hole can be examined in this. Or at least for a simple class. You can invent complicated things, you send them wave after wave, it doesn't matter, you have to work all the time. You can make something like can't understand. But if you settle for something that's easy, but I like a black hole in the real world that forms from class. I think you can describe the type 2 algebra in the world that applies there. I do not very proper assumption from the chat. No, that was just the, the, the asking to shut up. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so so this setup it doesn't have any pure state then how to make sense of something like the part of state the, like if I say the four universe have this part of function which is a pure state. Well it's not a pure state for the algebra on one side. So for the algebra on one side it's defines this function that <coughs> this property is slightly different for the black hole or, or the same space. The quick answer to the question is this. There's a notion of the state of an algebra. The state of an algebra is a function, the linear function of the algebra. I call it f of a in the lecture. But the Bayesian properties are actually wrote down. I didn't tell you they were the axioms defining the state of an algebra. I just gave an example. I didn't quite, I didn't quite write them. A state of an algebra it's a linear function a to f of a first of all it's linear and secondly it is f of a dagger a is positive to all a so the ordinary quantum mechanics such a thing is given by a density matrix the trace of a times a density matrix is the well that's also true for the two The algebra has mixed states. It has density matrices. So physics with the type 2 algebra is like physics with the subsystem or bare quantum mechanics. You have density matrices, but unless you can manipulate the whole universe, you don't really have access to a pure state. The difference is only that the ordinary quantum mechanics, there could have been a state where your subsystem is all untangled. So you're dealing with an algebra that does have pure states. I didn't tell you the definition of a pure state of an algebra. It's a little bit technical. But there is a definition. So I didn't tell you exactly the meaning of the state if you have type 2 algebra that doesn't have pure states. If you have a type 1 algebra, I think it would not be eliminated. I'll, I'll talk to you later about pure state. But I think it's like technical to explain. I did write a few months ago lecture notes, but what I regarded as a simple explanation. Is it, is it analogous to having no energy? And the trouble is, like, we're, is, is you try, well, it would be, except that you see, what happens, consider a, a thermofit system that had the Hamiltonian of zero at infinite units. We looked at the maximally entangled set. The tangent was in the number of qubits, which starts infinity. So we have to subtract that n, measure entropies relative to that. Then if we disentangle qubits, the entropy goes less, 
Nine runs up to zero, so minus one, minus two, minus three. We can go down forever, and there's no bottom. So there's no pure state because we can keep disentangling two bits. And there's no there's a maximum entropy which forget my lecture, just the standard thing people say in these consider space is that the bunch the, the natural distinguished state has the maximum possible entropy in my lecture that corresponds to the density matrix B1. But anyway, there's a maximum of entropy, but there's no clear minimum of entropy. Not many what is interesting. And in this context, there's a well, it, if you make an experiment, if you're an observer in decision space and you make an experiment and get the answer, if it was an unlikely answer, after you got the unlikely answer, the entropy is actually less. Because the very fact that you got an unlikely answer reduces the entropy. But this, there's no simple upper bound on how unlikely the answer can be. After all, you can keep making observations. You could flip a million coins and get very odd answers. And if you don't think that's strange enough, you could flip another million coins. So there's no real theoretical upper bound to how unlikely the outcome of an experiment can be without putting a bound on the complexity of this program. So since this algebra can describe experiments of arbitrary complexity, it doesn't give you a bottom value of the entropy. There might be a more precise understanding of physics where there is one, although I suspect that that doesn't exist simultaneously with the precise condition of the, that there's a horizon. That's all right. Uh, maybe one quick question is uh, uh, the calculation of uh, suspend. Yes. That did it fix? Did it have an, an additional uh, additive constant in it? Or well, Saskine doesn't have an additive constant, but um, but he doesn't do a calculation. What he does is to describe an ansatz of what he thinks <coughs> the microscopic model of the space will be. There's not a precise derivation of it. It's more like an ansatz, and a lot of things that Saskine says actually come out of this algebraic fiction, with one important exception, which is that in his story, there are one over four d qubits. But here we're expanding around the case where the number of qubits is infinite, and we really have to make that subtraction. Okay. So let's continue maybe our discussion uh, over wine and cheese on the eighth floor. So thank you again. <laughs>